we welcome you to worship today. And as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. A beachcomber looks for treasures in the sand. Searching the shoreline, every piece of sea glass that is gathered becomes something to marvel at, to cherish. In the same way, God gathers us and never stops finding things within us, beautiful things worth marveling at and cherishing. Like a beachcomber, Jesus combed the crowds and found in the people he met things of value, things worth healing. He broke down the barriers that had been built up between people he broke down the barriers that had been placed between people and God. He reached out and healed not only individuals, but entire communities. This past year, our various communities have been deeply wounded. Schools, work, places of worship, clubs, choirs, and sports teams. All those places where we find physical, spiritual, and emotional joy and support have suffered a great deal, and we along with them as our Lenten journey continues, we hold our community in prayer that together we might soon be healed and restored. Let us join our hearts in prayer. God of all, you created us for each other. You set in us a yearning for companionship, a desire for community, and an empathy that binds us together. Yet too often, we have broken down our relationships instead of building them up. We have been set against one another in the lie of scarcity. We have built systems and economies that widen the gap of resources. And too many of our neighbors are suffering hardship, food insecurity, joblessness. And we cannot fathom the proportions of loss, so we often look away. Help us, healer. Inspire our empathy. Forgive our complacence. Empower us to move, one step at a time, toward greater care for one another. In this silence, we sense, acknowledge, and offer to you our own yearning for wholeness as we place our personal confessions before you.
Know this truth, God's love and grace surround you, no matter what. You are a precious and holy vessel right now, just as you are. Christ's light is a treasure freely given for you, for me, for all people. So take a deep breath in and let this truth fill you and then breathe out with the relief of the assurance of God's grace. adapted from the story written by Jerry Pinkney. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Living things walked on the earth and flew in the skies and swam in the seas. And God saw that this was good. God was not pleased with the people of the earth. They did not care for one another. They did not care for the land that God had made. And they did not care for for God. But Noah did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord loved Noah. God spoke to Noah, and Noah put down his basket and listened. God said, Noah, make an ark out of cypress wood, for I am going to bring a great flood upon the earth, and it will swallow up all living things. Bring two of every creature onto the ark. Bring the food for them and for yourself. I make a promise to you. You and your family and the animals you bring will be safe. Noah did as the Lord commanded. His family helped him build an ark, and every day it rose higher and higher. It rose over their heads and over the trees, and the strong wooden beams embraced the clouds. At last, the ark was done. Noah and his family filled the ark with food and with water. People came, and they stared at the ark on the top of the hill. What fool would build a boat on dry land, they cried. The ocean's miles away, they laughed. But Noah trusted in God, and the clouds began to gather. God called to the animals, and from the aardvark, to the zebra, they came. The cows bounded through the grass, and the elephants ran across the ground, and it sounded like thunder. The wings of the birds cast shadows on the earth. Two by two, they came. All the animals of the earth. They came to the ark where Noah waited, and Noah welcomed them. The rains began, the lakes and the rivers and the creeks and the streams overflowed their banks. The oceans rose slowly, the water crept over the land higher and higher. The water rose over the cities and the towns, 
quail swam down the ruined streets, and schools of fish darted through the empty windows. God remembered Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. The ark floated on the waters, and everybody inside was safe. Zebras munched their hay. The turkeys gobbled up grass. And the monkeys nibbled on sweet grapes. They climbed to the roof where the sparrows were perched and where they sang. After 40 days and 40 nights, the rain stopped falling. God sent great winds to wash over the earth, and slowly, slowly, the waters began to go down. At last, the ark came to rest on top of the highest mountain, but all around there was nothing but water. Noah opened the window and sent out a raven to fly over the face of the water, but the raven found no dry land. Noah sent out a dove, but the dove found no dry land. But Noah had faith in God, so he sent the dove again. The dove returned to Noah with an olive branch in its beak. Then Noah knew that there was dry land at last. Slowly, slowly, the waters went down. Slowly, the earth dried. The sun shone again. The grass grew, and it was time to leave the ark. The owl spread their wings, and they soared. The panther sprang on the soft ground, and the lizards scurried. Noah and his family turned their faces to the sun, and they sang praises to God. God said, Never again will I send a flood upon the earth to destroy it. From this day forward, life on earth shall grow and prosper. And then God sent a rainbow in the sky. A sign of this promise to Noah, and to his family, and to every living creature. The End Hello and welcome, my friends. I hope that you enjoy that story that I just shared with you. It was written, like I said at the beginning, by Jerry Pinkney, not by me, just so you know. I was happy to share it with you on the second week of Lent. I know during Lent, we're usually talking a lot more about Jesus and not so much about old stories like, you know, Noah's Ark and the journey that takes us towards Easter. But I thought before we talk about that in the next couple of weeks, it's a really good idea to look back and stop and think about God. In the story of Noah's Ark, we see that God is with Noah and his family and all the animals through the building of the ark, through the flood, then when God promises that the flood would never happen again. God was with Jesus too throughout his whole journey through Lent as well. He was by his side. And guess what? I'm going to say the same thing as I said last week and the week before that, and I'm going to keep saying, because it's true. God is also with you. God is with us through the really big moments, through the hard things in our lives. Just like the floating boat full of smelly animals when they had a whole month of floating around with Noah, or walking towards Jerusalem knowing what was waiting there for Jesus. Or God's also with us when we feel kind of alone and we're missing our friends and our family and there's a pandemic going on and there's all these scary things. God is there, my friends. I just wanted to say this last little note. Thank you so much for joining me this week for our story. I hope you enjoyed it. A huge thank you to Arthur who put everything together. We'll see you next week. Bye. Today's reading is from Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 8, starting at verse 5. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I I also am a man under authority 
with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you according to your faith. And the servant was healed in that hour. Listen to what the scriptures are saying to our church. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every heart be acceptable unto you, O God, our Creator and Redeemer. Amen. On the surface, our story today is an easy one to wrap our minds around. A man has a servant. The servant has been paralyzed and is at home in terrible distress. Jesus is sought out, belief is expressed, and healing occurs. The man who also happens to be a Gentile, is praised for being the most faithful person in all of Israel, while everyone else is chastised and threatened with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Moral of the story, have faith, even if you're an outsider, and you'll be in better shape than most. But here's the thing. When it comes to the Bible, the stories that seem to be the easiest to wrap our minds around are generally the ones that have a hidden twist hidden in them somewhere. As my grandmother used to say, still waters run deep. In other words, there tends to be more beneath the surface when the surface looks calm and easy. So let's say we take a closer look at the story of this nameless outsider and see what else we can find. We know he's likely a Roman who serves the Roman army as a centurion. Consequently, in addition to his household, he has 100 soldiers under his command, hence the title centurion. He has status, wealth, and power. He can, is considered a leader in the community, not only by the Romans, but by the Jewish folk as well. And it appears he enjoys the responsibility and authority that comes with his position. He likes that people notice him and that they know who he is, that they do what he says and they follow his commands. And I would assume that he has every intention to continue on this path, gaining power and notoriety as his military career advances. But today, I imagine he tries to make his way through the city of Capernaum without being noticed. He is nervous. Anxiety builds within him. So he keeps his head down, sticks to the shadows, avoids making contact. He is searching for a man called Jesus, following nothing but whispers and rumors. He knows the Roman authorities have taken notice of this backcountry rabbi, and they've been told to keep an eye out for any type of Jewish uprising tied to him. The centurion knows that if word gets out that he himself is seeking the man's help, his career will be over. As a Roman citizen, he has been taught that the emperor was the true son of the gods. To believe otherwise is treason. But he's desperate, and though he's not quite sure what he believes, he can't deny the pull. There is just something compelling about this man whose reputation is seeped in stories of healings and miracles. And that's what the centurion needs right now, a miracle. We know absolutely nothing about the servant except that he or she is hurt, unable to move, and is in agony. Luke's gospel, where this story also appears, says the servant is close to death. We can assume that whoever this person is, they are of great value to the centurion. Perhaps it's simply a matter of them being really good at their job, but I doubt it. Why risk so much for someone replaceable? For one reason or another, the servant means something to the centurion. Maybe it's simply financial, or maybe they've become really good friends. Maybe they've grown into a treasured member of each other's household over the years. 
But whatever the motivation, the moment comes when the Roman and Jesus stand face to face, one begging for help and the other offering it instantly. I will come, Jesus says. It's not an easy thing to ask for help. But ultimately, the time comes to all of us when we are desperate for it. Alone, feeling that everything is out of control, we finally find the courage we need to reach out to others. And in that moment, what I think we all want to hear, without question, without judgment, without hesitation, are those words, I'm coming. And in an instant, we know we're not alone. The problem won't have gone away, but we'll know that we no longer have to face it by ourselves. And that makes all the difference. Mia Birdsong, a family activist who advocates for strong communities in the self-determination of everyday people, and who also offered a fabulous TED Talk a few years ago, if you're looking for something to do till this sermon wraps up, wrote a book earlier this year entitled How We Show Up, Reclaiming Family, Friendship, and Community. In it, she noticed so many of us have a deep aversion to asking for help. The idea of asking for help makes us feel like a failure, makes us feel weak. We often think of needing help as a burden, but that is toxic individualism talking. It is telling us that we should be able to do it on our own, that if we are strong enough, good enough, capable enough, we wouldn't need help. She goes on to quote Amaretta Morris, who said, it's okay to ask for help. In fact, by doing so, you are taking part in the divine circle of giving and receiving. While we often focus on what the request means for the asker or the recipient, we should remember that giving can be transformative for the helper. By not asking for help when you need it, you're blocking that flow. And so the centurion asks for help and Jesus offers it without hesitation. But there is a problem. Although Jesus is very willing to go, the truth is, he can't, or at least the centurion can't allow him. The gospel writer paints it nicely, of course, says the centurion feels unworthy to have Jesus under his roof, and maybe that's true. Maybe it came down to self-worth. Or maybe it was fear. Fear of what would happen should people find out that Jesus was there. But the fact that Jesus couldn't physically go to the centurion's home well, it hits a nerve. Distance is, of course, something we've all become much too familiar with. Each one of us knows all too well how our traditions have been altered at best, halted at worst. We've been able to celebrate, visit, or even bury our loved ones in the ways we're used to, ways we've come to cherish. This has been pointed out many times, I know, in worship and sermons these past 11 months, and one hates to sound like a broken record. But this past week, as my family mourned the death of our father, it became painfully clear to me just how unusual this all is. Normally in a time like this, the house would have been full. Family and dad's many, many friends would have gathered in droves. We would have laughed and cried together, faced the sorrow together. But after he died, the house was often noticeably quiet and empty. I know so many of you know what that feels like, have lived that. In a way, I guess I feel like that centurion asking for help, but understanding that few could come over even though they really, really wanted to. And yet, even in those quiet moments, I never felt alone. And I know exactly why. The Roman asks Jesus to help him. Jesus agrees. But in the end, they both know that for whatever reason, things can't happen the way they normally do. One would assume that Jesus would be the one to say, don't worry, friend, there's always a plan B. 
But in our story this morning, it's the centurion who changes things up. He's the one who says, you don't have to come. I know that's not possible right now. And it's okay, because I know how powerful you are. Just say the word, and healing will happen. And here again, we find the power of community, even in moments when that community is physically distant. Mia Birdsong continued, we exist not as wholly irregular autonomous beings, nor completely merged, but in a fluctuating space in between. This idea was expressed beautifully in Desmond Tutu's explanation of the South African concept of Ubuntu. He said, it is easy to say, my humanity is caught up. It is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of life. It is not, I think, therefore I am. It says rather, I am human because I belong. I participate and I share. It is amazing to me how strongly I felt my community around me these past few weeks. Dad said he felt it too. In one particularly dark moment, he said a calm descended over him, and he knew without a doubt that it was the combined prayers of so many people washing over him, helping him to feel better, stronger. I felt it too, again and again. I felt supported and prayed for, all of it reinforcing my belief that we are never alone. I knew we were being held in safekeeping. I realized early in my journey that the church is one of those places that people turn to when they need help and don't know where else to go. At first, I thought it was the power of the church itself, something it kind of innately held. But now I understand it's really about the power of community. When we have people around us, churchy folk or otherwise, supporting and helping us, life is easier. When we can find a group of people who willingly hold our broken and aching hearts for safekeeping while we figure a few things out, and who allow us to do the same for them, our lives become blessed. My friends, today I pray we might hold fast to the true power of our community, one where we give and receive help when we need it, that we remember how inextricably bound together we are, and that space has absolutely nothing to do with it. Our hearts are united because of the connections we share. Our spirits are bundled together through the Spirit of Christ, and through it all, we will find healing. Amen. Healer of our every ill, especially our malady of separation and fear, we come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are working among us showing us the way to recovery from toxicities and grief of our time. As broken pieces scattered and separated, we trust that you are seeking us, gathering us into wholeness, and calling us to join you in this faith journey. We pray especially for those who have experienced the loss of livelihoods and economic security. We pray for those whose businesses have gone under, or who are on the precipice between survival and closure. We pray for those whose disparity of resources have been made more pronounced during this pandemic. We pray for grateful thanks for the efforts of all those who have been searching for solutions to alleviate the suffering of both friends and strangers. We ask for encouragement and compassion as we continuously re-evaluate how we as a church can help during this time and into the future. We ask your blessing to fall upon the gifts that have been offered to this ministry, that our prayers for justice, kindness, and mercy might be lived out in real and life-giving ways. All this 
and so much more, we place into your hands as we say together the words you taught us and we love to hear. Our Father, our Creator, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. of Jesus we heard in this week's healing story are, I will come. And this story reminds us that we are all within God's circle of safekeeping. Not one of us is excluded from it. Last week, Sam invited you to bring to this space pieces of sea glass or beach glass. If you have some, take a moment now to notice them. Take a look at all the sharp and broken edges. These pieces are like each one of us, we all have experienced brokenness. Not one of us is without imperfection. We all face hardship. So take a moment and think about the people you have encountered or heard about in these last few months who are struggling, suffering, or even lacking the very basic level of support. Then shift your thinking to your own need to be cared for what do you need in this moment to feel safe? What connections do you need to heal any isolation or brokenness within you? These pieces are like each one of us. We have all experienced brokenness. But like this glass, we are also beautiful, something to be cherished and valued. If you are in need of something, consider this an invitation to let someone know what you need without feeling embarrassment or shame. Jesus invites us to do so. Jesus calls us to ask for help when we need it. If there is something you feel you are able to offer to others, feel empowered to do so. Jesus calls us always to live out our prayers by helping those around us. Then go from this moment with confidence, trusting that God gathers all of us for safekeeping. May the words of Christ ring in your ears, I will come. And may the Spirit hover over each one of us, 
moving us to new depths of understanding and delivering a healing balm for our souls this day, this night, and forever. Amen.